Good morning. I think maybe uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Ned Kalange. I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado Trust. I have the distinct privilege of being able to stand up in front of you know, a room full of my closest friends and, and uh, talk about health equity and, and uh, host, uh, although I do a little of the work, host the Health Equity Learning Series, which we're part of today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad you're all here and I welcome you. I think uh, the basis for today's session really came out of some learnings from our uh, environmental scan in 2011. Across the state, we heard how many people struggled in their lives with inequities and issues that faced them. There were common struggles, such as having to, the ability to provide food for their families or health care that was needed, health care providers being far away and no reliable transportation to get there. Uh, living in areas where they didn't have access to healthy foods, or if they did, not having the money to pay for it, not having a safe environment to live and play, and not having jobs that paid adequately or living wages for them uh, to survive. All of these factors impact the health of people in Colorado and in our communities. We believe an important way to shed light on these issues is through storytelling. And today's presenters are going to discuss how they've told stories around health disparities uh, through video, print, photo, and other media. They're also going to talk about the importance of sharing health equity stories. In, a t in addition to the preparation uh, or the presentation today, we've put materials at your places. The first is a new trust publication uh, that's focused on storytelling. It's written by Rebecca Kahn and Julia Lin from the Spark Policy Institute and provides tips on how to craft persuasive stories. Other handouts include an episode summary from the PBS series, A Natural Causes is Inequity Making Us Sick, and a summary piece from the iNews Network report, Losing Ground. There's also a description of a Blue, Scar Blue Spark collaborative project Raise the Raising of America. So I hope you find those uh, um, materials useful. You'll also find a evaluation form which we need to better craft and hone our skills at the Health Equity Learning Series. At this point, I want to pause and acknowledge our remote virtual participants. These are uh, 18 grantees across the state in different communities who are hosting what we call viewing parties. So they're not in the room, but they're participating both in the presentation and we, when we get there to the question and answer session. And I want to welcome everyone across the state in these communities. After the presentation, we'll engage in a dialogue with you here in the room and those across the state. For those of you who are streaming the presentation and not here with us, we'd ask that you submit your questions via Twitter you can follow the Colorado Trust and use the hashtag HealthEquityTCT. If you prefer, you can email us and email your questions to healthequity at coloradotrust.org and we'll do our best in the time allotted to answer all questions, whether you're in the room or in your own communities. So I'd like to move on and talk about our presenters today. Uh, first up will be Llewellyn Smith, who is the Director of Media for Production at Blue Spark Collaborative. This is a film and research company. In 2004, Mr. Smith uh, founded Vital Pictures, an independent Boston-based documentary company. He, he was the co-executive producer of the PBS series, Unnatural Causes, which investigated the impact social and economic conditions have on health and longevity. He will be followed by Laura Frank, who is the President and General Manager of News for Rocky Mountain PBS. Ms. Frank is a Denver native who spent more than 20 years at newspapers, radio, and public television around the country, focusing on in-depth reporting. She oversaw the creation of the 2013 iNews report, Losing Ground, which shed light on racial and ethnic disparities 
in Colorado. Let me uh, welcome Lou Ellen Smith up and he'll introduce the video. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. First I want to say uh, it's a, a pleasure, it's actually an honor to be here, to be invited to talk with you about the, um, to just engage in the work that you're doing. I want to thank uh, Ned Collange for inviting me and for, um, and also to thank the, the uh, Colorado Trust for, for having us here. Um, as Ned mentioned, I'm an independent filmmaker. I just want to check my time. I'm an independent filmmaker. Uh, I've been doing this for about 30 years, uh, working independently. My work is mainly focused on social justice issues, though I've done a lot of work with American history and it keeps coming back into my work and I want to talk a, lot, a, a little bit about the importance of history as a context for the storytelling that you may be doing. Um, so I've done, um, I've, the Vital Pictures Company was the company that I, I formed that was also the producers with California Newsreel of uh, Unnatural Causes, which many of you may have seen. Uh, the company I'm working with now is uh, Blue Spark Collaborative. It's the second company I formed with my wife, who's a psychotherapist, Dr. Annie Stopford. And she's the director of research for uh, a film that I want to show a clip from later called Wounded Places. Um, which looks at trauma in the lives of young people. And I, and I want to talk, I want to show that because it's an opportunity to talk about some issues around storytelling and the responsibility we may, we may have to, I think the responsibility we definitely have to the people whose story we are gathering and how do we, how do we, um, how do we see that responsibility and how do we honor it. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about um, well, I won't talk much about myself as a filmmaker, but one of the things that's interesting as a filmmaker is that you don't really generally get to see uh, your audience when you show something. You know, you don't, you have a sort of a disconnect with the audience. Um, you have an idea of who the audience is and you're writing and you're thinking about who they may be and how you're trying to inform their thinking. And it occurred to me last night that that may be a little bit different from the situation you may find yourselves in because the audience is, here in Denver, it's in Colorado. And that's a really different kind of thing when you actually are telling stories, the people who you, whose stories you're gathering and the people who you're trying to reach are actually in the community with you. And that's something to think about. It's a very different picture from, from the picture that I have of my own work. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Unnatural Causes and uh, the series and, and how we began to shape that series. Um, and, some, and then I also, also want to mention some ideas, at least that drive me in terms of thinking about um, what kind of values am I trying to, what kind of values drive me, what kind of questions actually get me excited and think, in terms of storytelling. What am I trying to achieve and some of the questions that sort of shape that, 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 that work. And then I want to show a short clip from Wounded Places later on. Um, which is, the most, which is my most recent film. It's actually looking at, as I, as I may have mentioned, it looks at trauma in the lives of young people in America in disinvested communities. And so we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, Wounded Places is looking at, uh, Wounded Places aired in 2008. Uh, it's a very complex series in its structure. It's one hour and uh, I believe it is six half hours. So it's actually a four hour series in seven parts. And each of the shorter films is based in a particular uh, ethnic community. Um, we were able to bring producers who were from those, those communities, the Native American community, from the Hispanic community, and so on, uh, into, you know, into our work to actually do and develop those films. Um, the series is based on extensive research, looking at, um, uh, I mean, collect, a collection of research from public health experts um, and, and medical practitioners. And the focus of the series is really how class and racism can have a greater impact on our health than uh, we might think, than genetics or behavioral outcomes, or, or, or behavioral, um, behavioral uh, personal behavior. Um, for me, one of the things that was really kind of uh, challenging as a concept is that uh, when Larry Edelman, who is the executive producer of the series, uh, brought the, the, the concept to us to, to work on, um, I, didn't, I had not heard of the social determinants of health. I didn't know what that concept was. And um, as we began to talk more about developing this series, uh, it became clear actually that there was really no other um, work that was out there that was talking about the social determinants of health that was written for a public 
ordinary audience. Uh, and I was talking about this last night, that all of the work that we could find was written for, was written peer reviewed for peers. Now this is an issue that's been actually uh, discussed in, in public health for over 100 years. There's been a lot, this is not a new concept, that there's lots of conversation, lots of writing, lots of research talking about how environment actually drives the health outcomes that we may see. But it was fascinating to me that there was nothing that we could find, there were two items that we could find that were written about this issue for a public audience, an ordinary, an ordinary audience. And one was uh, Michael Marmot's book, The Status Syndrome. Uh, which many of you may know, and then the other one was a short uh, article, actually, no, I'm sorry, a long article, actually, in the New York Times in 2003 by, uh, and I would, if you have a chance, you should take a look at this, it's a very interesting piece, uh, called Ghetto Miasma by uh, Helen Epstein. Um, very powerful piece. Those were the only two pieces we could find. And so what we saw our challenge being primarily was, in a broad strokes, how do you not only just to get your head around all this tremendous information that's been circulating and being discussed by experts, but then bring it into a storytelling context so that it's accessible to ordinary people. And that's an exciting challenge, but it also was a very daunting one. Um, we had a couple of uh, different sort of mantras that we talked about uh, from time to time. Um, Hold on a second, I'm a little bit lost here. <laughs> we had a couple of different mantras we talked about from time to time. And one was the idea of making the visible, making the, the invisible visible. That we're looking at, we're, we're really focused on not so much the stories in, of individuals as much as trying to use those stories to bring data forward, but also to illustrate or to illuminate the, 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 the structures and the, and the context in which people live. The historical context and the social context. And I think that's really important because the more that we, it, it, in, in terms of storytelling, uh, we're trying to create, I think, uh, emotional con connection with our audience. We're trying to tell stories in which they can see themselves. We're trying to connect them with people. And we're also sharing data that has hopefully a real life connection, a real life, um, a real life meaning for them. But there's a danger, I think, the more that we focus on the individual, the more that we start to get into, I think, a default place, which is sort of saying, well, in the case of health inequities, you know, these individuals are making good choices, these individuals are making bad choices. You know, why can't they make better choices? And I think that one of the things that we were trying to say is if you can step back and look at the context, in other words, if you have an environment where people are not able to make good choices as well, or, or they can't find food, or they can't find uh, safe housing, or they can't find green spaces as easily. <laughs> I'll take that as an amen. <laughs> but they can't find those things as easily as they might in another environment. Um, it's important for us to sort of see, to see that and to be a, and, and do both. So I think in terms of the storytelling we're trying to do, we're trying to bring in individuals who can help us see the the world that we're trying to explain in terms of the challenges that that, certain, that other people that some people have for health. But we're also trying to come keep coming back to what is the space that they're living in? What's the history of that space? And I think that's vitally vitally important. I want to come back to that in, in a moment. Um, a couple, of note, a couple of other notes about unnatural causes. Um, we talked about making the, the, the visible invisible. Um, we, also, um, we also talked about challenging the assumptions that the audience may have about what they're seeing. And, uh, and I think this is really critical. Um, one of, in, 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 the, uh, in the film, uh, in the first film, which is called, I think the title is, uh, I've forgotten, it's been a while, the title is uh, In Sickness and in Wealth. In the first film, um, we have three main characters. If you, if you have, if, has anybody seen the film? Okay, the, there are three, right, quick, there are three main characters. And it turns out they're all, you know, coming from the same hospital, but they're also representing different socioeconomic strata. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is that I think that the most important character uh, of those three is actually the head of the hospital. And the reason I think he's important is because he's the person who actually says clearly in, in a very reflective, very thoughtful way, I, I actually have the time to, and I actually have the means 
to get food. I actually can afford insurance. I actually can buy the food that I need. I have the time to cook it. I don't have to take two buses. And when he starts to, to explain this, I think about the middle class PBS audience that's watching this. They don't have to be as wealthy as he is. But I think there's a moment when they can, they can stop and say, wait a minute, I also don't have to take two buses. I also don't have to, uh, I also have the time to cook the food. I can buy the food I need to buy so that I can be healthy. What I'm getting at is that, again, it's very important, I think, for the audiences that we're talking about who may not be connected to these communities which are, which are facing economic challenges and health challenges to see themselves somewhere in the story. Um, and what we try to do is to, to put these stories, so sort of juxtapose these stories, so that hopefully wherever you are in, in the socioeconomic map of America, you can see where you are. Um, the other thing we talked about is, having, is, is empathy. That we wanted to create empathy for, think about empathy for the other. And which seems like a sort of ordinary kind of a concept, but I think that we, I think that it's very easy uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, I think it's very easy as an, event, as an individual to uh, not see other people who are in different situations, different races, who have different challenges as the same as us. How do you really start to tear down that unconscious wall so that we start to recognize that the people that we are talking about who are having uh, economic challenges and social challenges and, and health challenges, that they are us. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but it's something we talked about again and again and again. Um, another thing that we talked about in this film, and I, and I think it's much more present in some ways in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, the Wounded Places film, is that individuals who are living their lives wherever they are, whether they have a degree or not, whether they speak English or not, whoever they are, they are experts on their lives. And that needs to be respected. How do you respect that? People who are living in, challenge, in, in challenging conditions, they are the experts. People can come in and out, analyze that, but they have no idea what it's like to live day to day, uh, what it's like to put food on the table or not be able to put food on the table, or to take your child to the hospital and not be able. To, that We can imagine, but they know. How do you give those voices authority so that even in your storytelling, they have, they have presence? And not just as storytellers, but again, having authority that needs to be respected. We talked about that and, and, and how, do we, how, do, how do we respect that in terms of being, being storytellers. Um, the other thing we did was we knew that we wanted to repeat, that was the critical message that we wanted to tell about the, the uh, importance of how health is stratified in this society and the importance of stress and being able to alleviate stress and what happens if you can't that those two messages were critical and we wanted to repeat them again and again and again. So if you look at any of the films, if you never see but one of the films, you're gonna get that message. And that was what we thought was the critical message that needed to be told. And that's something to think about. If you have a campaign, what's the, what are the really essential messages that you want your audience to come back to? What are the really essential framing ideas that you want people to think about, even if, whether that's your work or whether it's something that you're literally going to put into the, 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 the storytelling that you're doing? So we talk quite a bit about that. Um, we talked about recognizing the systems as the source of inequity and suffering. Um, we didn't use the word suffering, but I would step back today and I would say, suffering. And we talked about how do you begin to make it clear again that the choices that individuals have are not just simply the, 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 the independent choices that they make as, as human beings, but they are also shaped by the choices that are available to, available to them, and that those choices are shaped by history in those environments and also politics. Um, one of the things we talked about briefly at that dinner last night, I was saying that the, the term, the social determinants of health, I think is very powerful and it's very telling, but you know, as I, when I look back at the series and I think about 
what that does, it, in some ways it lets us a little bit off the hook in terms of understanding the reality of what we're seeing. Uh, it still allows us to think that here's an environment in which how the society is shaped and the choices that these individuals have still is affecting their health. But it doesn't get to the fact that the, what is shaping these communities are political and historic decisions. And so is it the social determinants of health or is it the political determinants of health? And I think that's really important to think about. Um, again, I'm, I keep coming back to the critical need to contextualize these stories. We can tell great stories. We can tell powerful emotional stories. I think all of you can do that, and I think that's important and powerful. But if we're not contextualize them in terms of the history that's happened in these places that has advantaged some people and others, if we're not contextualize them in, 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 in that important way, we're basically in danger of telling the same stories over and over again in the same way, and we're going to get the same kind of responses. There's another picture that we need to think about, which is what, what history and, and social conditions are these stories nested in? And I think that's important for not just us as storytellers, but it's also important for the people whose stories we're trying to embrace so that they can begin to think about that as well. You know, I've come into too many conversations with people who are looking at their lives and struggling with what's going on, but they have no context for the idea that this thing you're dealing with has been going on for three generations in your neighborhood now. Why is that? Um, so a, a couple of other thoughts in terms of questions, that, in terms of framing. I, actually, there, there, there are two quotes that I have that I, I, that I get inspired by. One is by an, an, an epidemiologist and one is by a, a, an extraordinary writer. Uh, Michael Marmot, uh, this is in terms of the, point, the importance of storytelling. Michael Marmot, uh, who's an epidemiologist, actually Sir Michael Marmot, um, wrote a brief for the World Health Organization on the social determinants of health. This is for, the, for, for uh, the UN. And in the beginning of this massive brief, he, he, at the very early part of the brief, he says, evidence is rarely, if ever, sufficient by itself to catalyze political action or change or social consciousness in terms, in political terms, what might be at least as crucial as the evidence itself is the story in which it's embedded. We live by stories. That's how we shape our own identity. That's how we shape the world. That's how we understand who we are. And he's onto something which is critical, which is you can give me the facts, they're going to go. Make them real for me. Make me understand why it makes a difference. And that's what we were trying to do. In, in the series. The other is a, is a, is a, is a piece, is, a, is a, actually I, I owe this to, to, to a, a terrific filmmaker, uh, Marco Williams, who um, had this embedded in one of his emails, and I've just been, I haven't been able to get out of my head. And this is a quote that, uh, by James Baldwin, and he says, history does not refer merely to, he says, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are consciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. And if you think about the beginning of a natural causes, uh, the epidemiologist comes on and makes this statement. She says that, you know, our, his, our, our health, our history is, is living in our bodies. How could it not be? Of course it is. But why would we think it's different outside of our bodies? You know, we're all living, you know, a history that we can trace back to our, our fathers and our mothers and so on, but think about people, again, where you're talking about communities where people have been there for years and what's been happening in those places for years. Sometimes many good things, sometimes many bad things, and some things over generations. Why can we keep seeing, why do we see this? So, so this, is a, this is, I think, an important question. Um, I have some notes about, um, I think when stories can be transformative, and I want to go through those very quickly, I think that stories can be powerfully transformative uh, when the general audience is discomforted. Uh, in my filmmaking, I'm always trying to make the audience uncomfortable. I'm not trying to do that by insulting them. In fact, I always try to meet the audience and try to think about what I think they understand now and even reflect that back in the film, in, in the early part of the film. But then I want to start to take that apart piece by piece casually and carefully. 
And by the end of my stories, I want the audience to be uncomfortable. I want them to be uncomfortable with what they've learned, and I want them to be uncomfortable with what they've assumed, and I want them to sit with that for a while. That's my hope, is that they will not avoid that. If we can tell, if we have the, if we have the, 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 if we have the courage to tell stories that make our audiences unsettled, I think that that's a transformative opportunity. Um, I think that uh, stories are, are, can be transformative when they are retellable. So they have to be clear. And people have to take them and own them. It's the thing they talk about tomorrow, the thing they talk about you know, the next day, the thing they share, the moments that they share with, the, with each other. I think that that's part of the transformation, the transformative sort of event, is that people embracing those stories and saying, I own this story, in their own way, I own this story and I'm gonna tell somebody else about it because it has that inspiration. Um, I think that they, I think stories are also, this comes back to the idea of discomforting an audience. I think that it, stories can be transformative when they avoid telling the audience what they expect to hear. Um, I think that when we sometimes, at least for myself, and again, I'm talking from a filmmaking point of view, when I'm telling, when I'm trying to create a narrative, I'm continually thinking about, if I'm going into a narrative about race, or if I'm going into a narrative about a political action, if I'm the audience, what do I think is actually coming next? And then whatever it is I think is coming next, I'm not going to, I'm going to fight not to give it to you. Not because it's a way to be insulting, because that, because in terms of film, it shifts the way in which you're engaged with the narrative, you know, if what's coming next is not what you expect. Um, and if it's clear that it's also what's coming next is engaging. I mean, I, I mean, I think that, um, it's hard to, it's hard, in terms of film, it's hard to just give you uh, clear examples. I think that um, in Unnatural Causes, I think one of the things that happens is when we actually do the reveal that all three of these characters work in the hospital. You know? And I think that that sort of is one of those moments where people sort of say, aha, wait a minute. Uh, and, and then I think what also is interesting in Natural Causes is we sort of dismiss the hospital. Again, it, the health has not, has, has, our view of health doesn't have as much to do with hospitals as we might think. Our view of what happens in terms of how we understand the social determinants of health doesn't have as much to do with So it's interesting that we're doing the story in a hospital, but we're not paying attention to much of, what, of the business of the hospital at all. Uh, it's just a place. It could have been a corporation. It could have been anywhere, but it's a hospital. Um, uh, the one example I'll give again, and if many of you may not have seen this film, is a, a series called Race, the Power of an Illusion. Um, I was really fortunate to work on this series, and this was also from California Newsreel. And uh, in, in the last film, I, the, the series is looking at the, the, the way in which we construct race and, and, and how race is really a constructed idea that we live by. In the last series, the last film in the series, I'm doing a piece that's looking at the construction of whiteness, and early in the film, I, I make a statement, and the narration makes a statement that, you know, you know, even those of us who don't believe the stereotypes can easily recite them. And what I'm trying to do in that piece is to get, is to challenge the audience, because if you hear that, you, there are two things that I think happens. One is that you know the stereotypes about race, and you can recite them. How does that make you feel? And I think that happens fast in a film, it hap in a film that happens very quickly. But the question is, can we do similar kinds of challenging writing and challenging storytelling for the audiences that we're trying to reach out to, where we get them to really reflect inward as well as sort of really go into the story? And that's challenging. I think it's critical. How do you get your audience to think about themselves and think about their own experience? Um, I have a couple of other notes about, about storytelling. Um, so I think that's, I mean, I think that's the, um, I think that's the, those are the sort of the, the big sort of beats for me. Uh, I, I work in film, so I'm working visually very much. I mean, we, we work with, you know, narration, we work with other kinds of devices, but it's largely a visual medium, so I'm always trying to figure out how to, you know, connect an audience to, to a visual story. And I think that's, I think that's a powerful opportunity that you have as well, you know in terms of really bringing your characters to life through photography, through filmmaking, through film work, through videography. But I think that's a piece that you should also think about as well. But again, 
how do you, if you use video or if you use photography as a device, how do you bring the audience into a visual narrative that is not what they expect? Oh, here's the person who can't feed their children and this is what they look like. Is there another way to come into this story? Is there another way to show something that, they, that the audience might not expect to, to, to actually have access to, to expect to have intimacy with? Uh, I think that's, that's, those are the kind of questions that I'm asking that I would encourage you to ask as well. Um, I just finished the film. Um, um, my, my, partner, who's my, my partner, who's also my wife, Dr. Annie Stopford, was the, Dr. Annie Stopford was a, the, um, the develop, the, the, the uh, <laughs> was the head of research uh, for the piece. And it's called Wounded Places, Confronting PTSD in America's Shell-Shocked Cities. It's a long title. Um, and uh, this is part of a series called The Raising of America, um, Early Childhood and the Future of Our Nation. This is also from California Newsreel, the, the creators of the, of the Unnatural Causes series. And there's a, I think there's a, a flyer on your, on your uh, table about this. And uh, this is a series that's going to be um, one hour and four short uh, half hours. And, and, what I, and what we were producing at, 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 um, at Blue Spark Collaborative was, was a half hour. And what we were looking, and, and this half hour is, again, as I said earlier, is looking at trauma, um, violence, its impact on young people, its impact on the brain, its impact on the lives of young people in, 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 in impoverished cities. And we're going to show, I'll show a short clip from that in a moment. Um, but one of the things that came out of this for us was people were sharing extraordinarily, I thought, powerful stories. We're talking about young people who were shot at 18. Uh, a woman who was actually shot in the face and had to have her bottom of her face reconstructed is now working with young people um, and, 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 and the changes she had to go through to, to sort of come to that place. Um, and, and other stories, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is the need to really think in terms of audience also about empowering, and that word gets used too much, but empowering the people whose stories you're, 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 you're you're embracing, the people at the heart of the stories. I don't want to say that you're borrowing or taking, because I don't think that's right. But the people who are at the heart of the stories you're telling, whoever they are. Um, um, and that comes out of really being, frankly, respectful. And it's, and, and it's critical, I think, because many of the people that you're going to be doing your stories about and with, as I understand it, are also going to be people who are in communities where you're going to want to get traction once these things begin to move forward. And so in some ways, your storytelling is the beginning of that, that work, I would imagine. Um, the example I would use with, 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 there are a couple of examples that come to my mind in terms of the work with uh, uh, Wounded Places. I had a conversation, I had the opportunity, it was actually an honor to meet this, this, this woman, Carrie Gutierrez, who was a young woman. Um, her brother was shot, he was a gangbanger. Uh, a year later, she was shot. Uh, the bottom of her mouth was blown off. Uh, she went through horrific uh, trauma, uh, still suffers from PTSD, is working with young people as a counselor. Um, and I was doing an interview with her, and there was a point when she was telling the story about what had happened, and I had to ask her, is it okay for us to talk about this? This is not an interrogation. Is it okay? And, and give her the space to say, you know what, I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't go any further. It's, it's, it's having the sense that the people that we're talking to, that their stories in this process is, is as important for them to have access to as it is for you to have access to it. Um, and it was interesting. I wish we could have used her response, but her response was, I've been preparing for a couple of days for this conversation. So she was okay. But it wasn't like it was just an ordinary, let me tell you what happened to you. So let me tell you my story for the third or fourth time. There's another guy in the film, um, Avi Aringa, who's also a remarkable kid. Uh, he talks about, I mean, you want to talk about early childhood trauma. His story he talks about, and this is not in the film, unfortunately. He talks about one of his earliest childhood recollections as being in Colombia as a three-year-old kid. His father has got him by the arm, running down the street, shooting at somebody else. He's in a violent neighborhood. His father is obviously in, caught up in violent 
activities, um, comes to America, winds up in um, Oakland. One of the first things that happens is somebody gets beat down at his doorstep. I mean, it goes on and on. Eventually, he's, he gets shot, he's paralyzed. And after he gets paralyzed, he, becomes, he starts running a gang. So he eventually gets out of that situation and begins to become a, a counselor for Catholic Charities. And, and we were able to show the film, and, and, and I bring him up because he said something very powerful to me after we, when we showed the film. And he was there, and there were people there who were there. And I was very nervous because when you're showing a film and the people who are in the film and the people whose stories you've you, you tried to embrace, not appropriate, but you tried to embrace, are there. You want them to recognize themselves in their story on the screen. You want them to say, that's, that, even if that's not all that I said, that's real, that's, that's, I, I, that's me. And he said something very powerful. He said, he said, seeing the film helped him understand what he had been through. And it helped him understand what other people were going through. In other words, it gave him a, a different kind of a narrative, a different way of looking at what his life had been up to that point and who he was. And that's another thing that these narratives can do, the stories you're trying to tell. With, with sharing the information, sharing the research, humanizing it, bringing it into the context that we're talking about, that's information, that's power. Being able to name something, being able to say, wait a minute, this thing that's happening in my neighborhood, this really isn't really just about my family, it's actually about, that's power. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that. You have, two, you have multiple audiences. You've got the larger audiences of professional people and, and people and, 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 who, and legislators you're trying to affect and, and people who are investors and so on, so on, so on, so on. But the other audience is the people whose stories you're telling. That's a critical audience for you. And that has to be, that's a, there's a moral, ethical obligation to really pay attention to that audience. Um, so I want to uh, just introduce this clip, and I hope I'm not running over because I have no idea what time is. So um, I want to introduce this clip. This basically I want to show a short clip from uh, the, the um, Wounded Places film. And then I want to talk a little bit about it afterwards in terms of why I wanted to show this clip. Um, the, this is not, this film, this clip does not have uh, any of the major characters from the film in it. And actually it comes at a point where we've been talking, the first part of the film we're talking about what happens to young people who are dealing with trauma and violence. The second part of the film we're starting to talk, this, we're talking about what happens to children who are exposed in, to, in that world and what kind of adult health outcomes they can expect if they're dealing with, you know, the kind of stresses that we're, that, that we're talking about here. Um, so I want, this is, clip was about six minutes um, and um, then I'll come back and I'll just finish up. The stressors many children face day to day in neglected communities like North Philadelphia can be relentless. We can really manage a lot of stressors. If we are crossing the street and we see that a truck is coming at us, we can manage that situation, get scared, jump, and move quickly. Unfortunately, many children in our society feel like a truck is coming at them all day long for more days than not. And this really takes a toll. We know from a new body of research that exposure to chronic stress early in life can lead to actual changes in brain architecture. A child's development is affected by chronic stress. The impact of the chemicals that are released as a result of stress, that kind of unrelenting drip, drip, drip that affects then the way the brain develops. So language functions, the ability to think clearly, the ability to focus, to organize thoughts, all of that is being laid down in very early childhood. When a child is exposed to toxic stress, then the brain is not connecting the way it should. Especially toxic for children can be exposure to conflict or violence in the home. I remember having a little 
two-ish, three-ish year old child who was hitting their baby doll. Well, they didn't make that up, even if they weren't in the room when the domestic violence occurred and when the physical violence occurred, they still feel those effects very, very deeply. They are perceiving the world as dangerous all the time and defending against those feelings by becoming aggressive. They may have the history of what happened. They may have feelings about what happened, fear, sadness, anger. They may have no words for these feelings. And then they have these behaviors. But they really do not connect all of them. They don't know that because this happened, I developed these feelings that make me behave this way. And for many of us who serve children, we don't make those connections either. A 2005 study reported the number of children expelled from preschool for behavioral problems at three times the expulsion rate for K-12 students. In 2012, in Connecticut alone, 2,000 children six years and under, overwhelmingly black and Latino, were suspended from kindergarten and preschool, dramatically increasing their risk of dropping out later and being sent to prison. Instead of labeling them as bad kids, why don't we see them as children facing adversities that other children don't? Why are we re-traumatizing young people who are already traumatized? We've become so blaming that whenever somebody strays, it's their fault and they should be punished. In the mid-90s, doctors Vincent Felitti and Robert Anda published groundbreaking research assessing the links between childhood adversity and adult health and well-being. In the original Adverse Childhood Experiences study, known as the ACE study, 17,000 mostly white, mostly middle-class adults were asked about 10 different types of childhood adversity. When you were a child, were you physically or psychologically abused by parents? Did you live with someone who abused drugs? Were you neglected? Was there domestic violence? Did anyone go to prison? Was someone in your home mentally ill? Respondents were assigned one ace for each of the 10 types of adversity experienced. Surprisingly, more than one in five of this mostly middle-class population reported three or more ACEs. But even more eye-opening was the correlation between childhood adversity and adult mental and physical health. The higher the ACE score, the more likely people were to suffer from things like heart disease, liver disease, lung disease, depression, suicide, IV drug abuse and alcoholism. What it said was, we've got a common causality for all of our major health and social problems. And it was all related to what had happened to them as children. I had to fight to keep this clip in the film because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as dramatic we lost track of our characters, none of our characters here. But it was, to me, this is one of the most critical sort of pieces that, that's part of our, the conversations we ought to be having. Is what is happening with the children in our communities? What kind of, and we need to be knowing that, or talking about that, not only because, not only because there are children, but because there are clear, as, as, as the research shows, there's, there's adult outcomes, there are health outcomes that are connected to how our children are living their lives. Um, What happens next in the film is also important. I wish you could see that, but it's a very short piece. But basically, the researcher talks about, you've got the ACEs study, but he's, then he talks about, but wait a minute, what about poverty? Poverty is also a stressor. And they do the research, and they show, in fact, that the children who are living in poverty have even, you know, even greater you know, stress, even more ACEs in terms of the, the population. So I guess that what I'm getting at is that 
information can be very powerful pe for people. We showed this clip. I wasn't, when the, I wasn't at the place where we showed the clip, actually. Uh, uh, Annie, my wife, was doing some research in, in Baltimore, and we were able, she was able to put together a screening with some people who were uh, working for Safe Streets, which I don't know if you know Safe Streets. They actually do a lot of intervention work, and when there's violence, they actually try to sort of stop the, the, uh, the cycle of violence from happening. So they're very much in the streets. So they put together a screening with a bunch of kids who were, who were connected to this organization, and they showed the film. And, I, and what she told me was very surprising, again, in terms of empowering audiences. The stories of people being shot and their experiences and these young people struggling with these issues, that just went past them. They had no interest in that. They're living that reality. It was like, well, well, why am I watching this? You know, I've already lost so-and-so. I've already been there. I've already been to the funerals. I don't need to see this. The piece where they stopped was this piece. And I think that the reason, I'm going to fix 30 seconds. <laughs> the reason why I think they stopped is because there's a moment of asking themselves, wait a minute, I've, I've seen these things in my life. Are you telling me that these things that I'm looking at, that I've lived through, that I've seen around me, are actually connected to all the other disease and all the other problems I'm seeing in my family, other people's family? Are you it's a connection that, again, it's a chance to name and think about what it is that we're actually seeing in, 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 in the place where we are and to create a different narrative about who we are and, what, we're, what, and what, what is causing or creating the health situations we're living with. Um, I've run over my time, so I want to thank you for letting me be here, and I, um, I applaud your work seriously, and I, 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 and I wish you the best of luck. <clears throat> Thanks, Lou. Now I'd like us all to welcome Laura Frank from iNews and Rocky Mountain PBS to the podium. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stories that we have been telling around health and disparity. And I'm hoping to share with you some of the things that we've learned both good and bad, for what makes those stories resonate with communities. And then I think afterwards we're going to have some time for Q&A, so I hope that we can get down to some of what you are doing and um, really get at some ideas that might help us all. Um, as Ned said, I am uh, working at Rocky Mountain PBS iNews. We do in-depth stories. Our motto is news that makes a difference. Um, we've had a series of stories that we've seen impact from, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. We did a series of stories revealing that there has been an epidemic in hit and run accidents. Maybe you've seen some of this. We, we looked at this in a, just a few weeks after we did this story, the state legislature passed the Medina Law. Um, if you've been on the interstate and seen the signs over the interstate that say something like, look out for the white truck and here's a partial license plate, that's the Medina Law des designed to have the public help uh, to try to solve some of the unsolved hit and run accidents. We've seen behavior change. That picture is from a story we did where we showed that um, doctors who were receiving payments from drug companies weren't always revealing those payments to their patients. They were supposed to, by law, disclose those payments. And after that uh, set of stories, more doctors started following the law. So we've seen behavior change. And we've seen real benefit to people. We did a, a series of stories about K-12, those cyber schools, the online schools, and we could show that half the students were washing out. And if they stayed in the school, their test scores were going down. And then when they did leave the school, they were going back to the original brick and mortar public schools who then had to educate them but had lost the money that they would get to do that job. So we've seen a series of, of stories that have had real impact. 
We're a little bit different kind of news organization. We actually, you may have seen and heard some of those stories, not on Rocky Mountain PBS, but maybe other places where you get your news. We share our content with every daily and in fact every weekly newspaper in the state. We share it with all the public radio stations. We even share it with the largest commercial television and radio stations in the state and including some ethnic and emerging media, some online only media. Um, we did a story, what I want to talk about most today. Some of you know, I recognize some faces who have actually helped us on this project. It was called Losing Ground. How many, has anybody in here heard of it? For those of you who haven't, it looked at growing disparity and some of the most important measures of social progress. So looking at health, education, income, poverty, and it showed that gaps, disparity, had grown since the time of the civil rights movement. So things were bad, the gaps of disparity were large, they got better, and then something happened in uh, the late 80s and early 90s and those gaps started growing again. And so I want to talk, this was a story that came out about 18 months ago, and I'll foreshadow here that it is still having impact, and I want to share with you some of the ideas that um, people had and some of the reasons I think this kind of story had real impact. Um, but first, some details. We looked at one of the, the key indicators of health, as m I'm sure most of you in this room and um, following along uh, remotely know, infant mortality is one of the key indicators of health. And we looked at data going back 60 years. And um, in health, we found that Latino babies were 63% more likely to die in their first year of life than Caucasian babies. And for African American babies, it was 200%. Three times as likely to die in their first year of life. If you look at the historical trends, this uh, graph goes back to 99, um, you can see that white infant mortality is going down. Latino infant mortality is actually going up. There are developing nations where the infant mortality rate is not rising. And if you look at, at the African-American rate, it's dropping, but it's still tremendously high. Um, in fact, Colorado's infant mortality rate puts our state squarely between Colombia and China. Now, you would think that this information alone, put together in a story if I introduced you to some of those babies who were at risk and let you know about what was happening, that that might be enough for the community to react and do something. And sometimes it is, those examples in the beginning, sometimes it is enough. But too often, it isn't. And maybe some of you have had this experience in telling a story. You tell what you think is a very powerful story, and you put it out there, and you get crickets. This has happened to me many times as a journalist. And I have a theory about why it happens. And it goes something like this. When you put together a story and tell it, if you just leave it at that, it's a very frustrating experience for people who are consuming that story, whether it's in print or audio or video. I imagined um, during my many years as a newspaper reporter that people would see my stories on the front page of the Sunday paper and say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I can't believe that's happening. But what can I do about it? So we did something very different with losing ground. We did more than the stories. We maybe could call this a little bit of news plus. So we created, in fact, um, you have um, at your tables, we created um, a community engagement kit. And this is what it looks like. If you open it up, you don't have to do it at your table, I'll do it up here. If you open it up, it's a three foot 
information graphic. Now, I know some people don't like information graphics, but this tells the whole story in a nutshell, and it helped start some conversations. Now, you don't have it in yours, but I'll give you one if you want. We had this engagement kit inside, which was a bunch of sheets of paper that had a discussion guide and a social media starter kit and an action opportunities guide, among other things, so that if you read or watched or listened to this story wherever you found it and something spoke to you in that, gosh, I wish I knew more about that infant mortality rate. Who's working on issues of disparity in health? Well, you could look on this list and see some of the organizations that were working in different areas, poverty, education, incarceration, race relations, family, economic development. We split it up and let people know there are paths to being able to do something if you're so inclined. And we mailed this to every elected official in the state, every CEO of every major company, every leader of every nonprofit organization, and we handed them out um, at events like this. And we got a huge reaction from that. But we didn't stop there. We also did, up in the right, we did an ebook. And that became curriculum in high school and college classes. And we did online interactive graphics. Um, young people really like those. <laughs> we were trying to meet people where they were, especially going across platforms, because some people learn best by reading, and others by hearing, and others by watching, and others by doing something, interacting somehow. So we tried to put the information everywhere it was. But then something really interesting. Um, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we didn't stop there. We had follow-up. So multiple times on our air, we would have people come in and talk about what was discovered and what it meant and where people wanted to go from there. We then did a half-hour documentary about a certain portion of this, it was called the cliff effect, and that is when single parents, 90% women, um, are trying, are, are this close to getting out of poverty, our system, our political decisions that we've made have a system set up that if you get a raise, even a dime an hour raise, if you go over our limits, you start losing work support. So you may lose thousands of dollars in childcare by just getting a 10 cent raise at work. Yeah. Um, we partnered with universities and libraries to hold public forums where people could come and talk about. Um, I, I recognize some, I know some of you have been to some of those. Those were some of the most emotional meetings I've ever been to. People really wanted to be able to talk about what they had learned from the report. But here's the really amazing thing. Now I'm ready for that slide. The really amazing thing was this. Other organizations began to take this on themselves. Um, the communities took over, which was a really fantastic thing. Um, my favorite, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, the civil rights commissions in Denver, there's a, a Latino civil rights and there's an African American civil rights commissions. They had never worked on anything, I'm told, together before. They began to work together to look at some of these issues. Um, the International Hispanic Network is held one meeting about it. They're about to hold another one. But my favorite example is the Colorado Black Roundtable. And they are African American leaders from all over the state, and they meet monthly and, and try to address important issues. They completely cleared the decks and said, we're going to do a whole summer of losing ground. This was last summer, not this past one, but the one before 2013. They planted yard signs. They robocalled 40,000 people. They held a summit at Manual High School where 500 people came, including every African American elected official in the state. And they didn't come to say, well, look, here's what Losing Ground found. No. They said, Losing Ground sets the foundation. We now can stop arguing over what's true or not true. We can spend all our energy into fixing it. And that's what they did. They began to break people up into action groups around the topics that you see um, in your handout. And they created themselves 
a white paper that is full of recommendations for what they think could happen next to try to address the disparity. And I just wanted to share with you some of what the author of this report, Dr. Sharon Bailey, wrote. She said, losing, the Losing Ground project of the Rocky Mountain PBS iNews served as a wake-up call for African American communities in the broader Colorado community. After more than 12 months of community meetings, a major summit, and additional research, we, the round table, asked ourselves several critical questions. How could these trends have gone unnoticed and unaddressed for so long? What can we do as a community to address these growing disparities and regain the ground that's been lost? It's our hope that these persistent injustices and growing disparities are igniting the flame of a revitalized 21st century civil rights movement. It's our hope that this working document will continue to broaden the conversations and possibilities. We must critically consider what we must do from here and what happens if we do nothing. From education and economic disparity to criminal justice and health disparities, our needs are great, but so are our talents. It's time to put them to use. And so on September 26, they're going to have a second annual conference, they're calling this one Gaining Ground. And some of the recommendations of this, um, I commend this to you, if you go to our website, you can download it if you're interested, but they've broken up the uh, recommendations for individuals, community organizations, and leaders and elected officials. So there's something for everyone here. Um, this has been one of the most amazing things I've seen as, um, as a journalist. So just to wrap up, I'm gonna to try to catch us up on um, some time here so we can spend time with the Q&A. Uh, these are the five things that I think are key when you're talking about storytelling to engage people and, and have that kind of impact that we all hope these stories bring. The first is how compelling is it, how important. It has to be something that resonates and is, as, and is important to people. Ubiquity, it needs to be spread as far and wide as possible. If it can be everywhere people are looking, that could be the best. There has to be engagement, some way for people to interact with the story, to become involved. There needs to be follow-up. It's not just a one hit, we've put it out there and that's it. What happens next? And there's, there's more happening, there's more coming, more coming follow-up. And then finally, partnerships, working with other organizations because no one can do it alone. Now, I really tried to come up with a clever acronym for this. It came out as KUFP. So if you think of something, if you, you can edit my, you know what I'm trying to say with these, edit them, email me the acronym and we can start using it. It'll be great for future training possibilities. But these are really the things that we are finding help the stories go a little bit further. So I'm just gonna stop there and we can do Q&A. Thank you. That was great, both of you. <clears throat> We're gonna launch into a question and answer session. I just wanna remind folks that if you're not in the room, please uh, Twitter using hashtag healthequitytct or email us at healthequity at coloradotrust.org. Uh, <clears throat> and I always get the prerogative of getting us started. And I'll tell you, there's a real um, uh, variability in the degree to which their organizations and nonprofits have resources dedicated to communications. So <clears throat> given those challenges, how do you recommend people get started in using storytelling uh, to tell their story and to describe their work? I would say use the media. I know this is, um, some of you are probably gonna roll your eyes at me. I can't even get a reporter to listen to my story, let alone tell it. And that is a challenge. We were talking a little bit at dinner last night about 
uh, the challenges facing media. There just aren't enough reporters anymore to, to look closely at some of the most important issues out there. And I, um, I may regret saying this publicly and on camera, but there is one way that this could be considered. There's one way to look at this as an advantage. If you and your organization, if you are good storytellers and you can put together an email with the beginnings of a compelling story and some suggested sources and reach out to a reporter who now has to write three stories a day and tweet and post on Facebook or whatever it is, the chances of you getting attention for that versus anybody else who's just calling up and or sending, you know, sort of the traditional press release are probably greater. That would be my advice. Do you have anything to add? I don't think I can add anything to that. So I, I have another one. So, you know, introversion, introversion often runs rampant during the first part of Q&A. So people are formulating their questions, so keep formulating. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, when a story doesn't take off. And, uh, and Lou, you, you hinted at this, that you're rarely in the room with the audience and being able to see the reactions. Um, are there aspects of storytelling that we should be concerned about having a negative effect, that the story uh, not only falls flat, but um, has an unintended consequence of, of having a negative reaction? And how can we try to not have that happen to us? Uh, you know, I, I would, that's an interesting question, and I have sort of mixed feelings about sort of trying to uh, control that. I know that um, for um, a number of projects, like big projects, like a lot of natural causes, and even in terms of uh, the, uh, the the childhood development project that we're talking about, that there's been a lot of sort of concern about how do you not get people to sort of go into their sort of default thinking about certain issues. And I'm not sure that you can, um, I'm not sure how much control you can have over, over that sort of uh, negativity. Um, I don't know, what do you think? It, it's kind of hard to anticipate unintended consequences, or they wouldn't be unintended usually. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not sure how you, how you try to address it. I, I would say be brave, rather worry less about unintended consequences and worry more about there are really important issues out there that the public doesn't understand and try to prioritize what are the most important. I mean, I'm sure for you all, as it is for us, who, who are professional storytellers, there are so many stories that we feel like need to be told. And you may have that same, where do I start? There are so many things. If you can try to prioritize what it, what seems to be the most urgent, and you can judge that in multiple ways, uh, affecting the most people, if it doesn't get fixed quickly, it, others are going to get hurt, um, there's a potential for fixing this problem, there's something pending in the legislature, whatever criteria you measure urgency with, if you can focus on those first, then I, you know, don't be afraid of what you might do. Be afraid that you might not do it, I think. Let me take the microphone here and then Phil or someone can go up here. Gretchen. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you all again. One of the takeaways clearly is the importance of putting an individual within a larger context. And in the Losing Ground series, it seemed to be a historical reference of census data that helped with that. In the clip that you showed us, heavy on the MD role there in terms of putting the context was from a, um, a medical history knowledge perspective. 
Are, so you have the sort of expert way or you have the history way. Is there another way for us to contemplate putting things into context or three or four other opportunities to do that besides just those two methods? Those are very important and, and we think we use them in our work, but I'm just curious to tap your expertise if there are other mechanisms for creating context for individual stories. Um, one is asking and being able to answer the question, why should I care? So if you take, pluck the average person off the street, why should that person care about what, what it is you're trying to describe? So I would say that would be another one. You know, I, I, um, I don't know if I, I know another context, you know, for framing, you know, these, the, the kind of thing you're talking about, I guess, and I, I keep coming back to for myself for history and the social context because I think that we, we in this country really uh, don't pay much attention to history, and the fact that it really does shape and determine a lot of the things that we're seeing. We're, I think we're completely unaware of that, and I think in other countries, people are very much alive. The history is very much alive, very much aware. That they're very much aware. Of it. So, I, so I think that for me, those those ideas, those 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 framings are underestimated. So I, I keep gravi gravitating back to them. Yes. Is this? Uh, it's on. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know if you were aware that we're getting ready in Colorado in the early childhood community to roll out both mini grants and a whole effort to support the raising of America. Um, Okay, <laughs> so I thought it would be important that you knew that, and we're very interested in using pieces of the film, and the grants will go to communities throughout the state to get the word out, of, especially on the points that you made. And I guess as we do that, I'm wondering about the baseline that you found in communities of knowledge so that we don't presume too little or too much about the toxic stress, ACEs, I mean, is the assumption that this is completely new, the connections are completely new, that, that was true to me as somebody in the field. I'm just wondering what you found as you went about telling the story. I think, I think for my, I mean, just briefly, I think for many people, even many professionals, it's very new information. I don't think you should assume that people have that knowledge at all. I was sort of, I, I, for myself, I was thinking that I'm sort of in a sort of a pool of ignorance until I realized it's a very large pool of ignorance around these issues. So, so I would I would say uh, I wouldn't assume that that that, that um, I wouldn't worry so much about people already knowing about the information. Next question. You talked about um, stories are powerful when they're discomforting to the audience. How do you take that a step further? and make people safe and share in their ex own experiences. So many times I've heard that, oh, that really resonated with me, but if I was honest, but if I was honest in sharing that story and sharing how I felt, I risk being labeled. So how do you get people to open up and be honest about their experiences? I guess when I'm, when I'm talking about discomforted, I think I'm thinking about the larger audience that may be, um, Ignorant, not have as much access to the, the the the, the kind of the, the the story we may be talking. So, if we're talking about a story that is looking at um, young people dealing with uh, young people and their health outcomes in, in, a, in a, situ a particular situation where they're impoverished or there've been generations of, of difficulty, I think that the, the, it's not so much that community that I'm trying to seek to discomfort so much as people who are not connected to that community and learning about that community. That's just my, my view, because I think that when people, when we, when, when we are sort of challenged that way, I'm sorry, who asked the question? I'm trying to see you, yeah, thank you, I'm trying to see you. <laughs> when we're challenged that way, I think we, we start to think and we start to reflect differently, and I think that there's, there's, there's an opportunity for change and action um, when that happens. That's, my, that's been my experience in terms of people reflecting their, their experience back to me. So I, I, I think at the same time, um, so I don't think that, I don't, I'm not trying, I don't, I don't mean that as a way to sort of, um, what am I trying to say, keep, people, keep other people from sharing their stories. Did you want to add something? I, I was just going to say, it is, it's hard and it's kind of a, a, a balancing act. I spend, as a journalist, a lot of time trying to persuade people to let me tell their stories. 
And there have been times where I've had to realize that person can't share that story right now for, for whatever reason it is. But when I think that it is important and a good idea for sharing the story, one of the things I talk to people about is just that. Why, why, why are we doing this at all? Why, are, why is this story important for people to know? And talk with them about if you are willing to share this story, it could impact other people who were in the position you were in. It could keep people from getting in the position that you were in. Whatever, you know, it's kind of hard to talk in generalities about this, but you know, I share with them the reason I think it's important to tell the story, but it's, it's definitely, you know, it's not my decision alone whether that story gets told, it's, it's theirs too. Maggie, could we have a question from the remote audience? So this comes from our online audience. So you both talked about a lot about African American communities and also the Latino communities. How do you capture other communities in these stories? So for example, Asian Pacific Islanders or refugees or immigrants and others. In the, in the Unnatural Causes series, we actually did have uh, stories from Pacific Islanders and from Native Americans and, and other communities. And what we, were able to, what we did was we found producers who were connected to those communities who would be comfortable going in and, com and, and, and people would be comfortable sharing their stories with them. And I think that's a really critical part of, um, uh, I think that's always a critical part of, of that kind of work for me. I mean, at going into places I'm, I'm, that if, where I'm not connected, finding people who can help me be connected in those places. And in some places, in some situations, I might, I've been in situations where I just really, you know, to get the story, to get the conversation I really want to get, I have to not be in the room. But I think it requires having people who ideally who are connected to those places, those communities, to, to, to share and be trusted. And for losing ground, it's, it's kind of a glaring omission. And I can explain the reason for the data, the census data going back to the 1960 census, there weren't enough numbers going all the way back historically to make any comparisons. And if you want to hear the really interesting story of what the census data did and how, it, how the Census Bureau completely screwed up counting Latino Americans in you know, the 1960s, it's kind of funny, I'll tell you afterwards. I'll just, wait, no, that, that's not fair. I can't tell you. Oh, it's a funny story, and then I'll tell you. I'll tell you the very short version. They asked people, for instance, they asked people in the Southern, they asked this, the question, are you Latino? They didn't ask it that way. Um, they asked, are you from South America? And people in the Southern part of the United States said yes. I think it's a... Uh I would just add to the comment, there's a, there's a structural issue um, that's inherent in the categorization of uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders. There, that actually refers to no fewer than 60 different cultures with over 30 different languages. And it is a small numbers issue that we lump them together. So I, I think it's a particular issue that the Institute of Medicine and the Roundtable on uh, Health Disparities is specifically looking at how can we better realize that aggregating those groups for the simplicity of statistical description is really doing a disservice to the different cultures that are involved. So, uh, Rudy? Yes, check, check. Um, I wanted to ask the question of, uh, you know, there are a lot of community-based uh, organizations of color working in communities of color uh, that don't have the expertise to uh, develop media contacts, storytelling. Uh, I run Servicios de la Raza. We've been around for a long time in Denver, and we had the good fortune of uh, partnering with Evolution. Uh, uh, now, my question is, for agencies that don't have the good fortune, what can PBS or what can you offer uh, to help build capacity and expertise with these organizations? Okay, I'll go first. One of the things that, um, that we did, in fact, where you were involved, was invite people in, and this is, this is an unusual thing for journalists to do, but we were in the mode of experimenting with this, so we were excited to try it, and it was so valuable. 
before Losing Ground was ever released, before the stories were ever reported, back at the very point where we had just done the first round of data analysis and saw, wait a minute, what do you mean the disparities are wider now than they were back then? We reached out to organizations and leaders and invited them in um, to our building and said, here's what we're seeing. What, does this ring true to you? What kinds of questions should we be asking about this? Where, what could be some of the reasons for this happening? And it was so valuable for us to be able to hear that kind of response that, that people gave, and it really changed the way we approached that. So one of the things we're doing from our end is trying to reach out more. Let me try to think of a way if an agency doesn't have, and gosh, who has enough money to have all the positions that you really, especially small um, organizations, how can you reach out? We have something at Rocky Mountain PBS called the Public Insight Network. And if you go on our website, rmpbs.org, uh, on the right-hand side, down, uh, on, down on the right-hand side, uh, you will see a place where you can sign up for the Public Insight Network. And uh, you can become a source. And what we do is send out emails where we let you know what we're working on. And when we're looking for expertise or just experience on a particular topic. So you might get an email from us saying, hey, we're doing a follow-up to Losing Ground, and we'd like to talk to people who had this kind of experience or who are thinking about these kinds of issues. Please contact us or can you know, send us an email. Can we contact you? So that's one very direct way. Okay, I think I have a question over here first. Hi. Um, so I have a question regarding oral health, because um, we see it as a health equity issue. Um, and I wondered if you, through the story collection that you did, if you actually cover that. Um, especially looking at the K through 12, because we see that being a major problem why kids miss and drop out of school. Um, so I just wanted to get some heads up on where that conversation is and if you see it as one of the health equity issues. Oral health is absolutely on our radar. We did a piece, I think two years ago now, looking in depth at some of the issues of oral health. Our health reporter, Kristen Jones, is right here in the pink. She'll give a wave right here. Um, and I know that's been something that she has had on her radar screen as well. So the answer, and the short answer is yes, absolutely. Oral health is seeing mental health as well. I, I forgot to mention that we just finished, Kristen just finished um, a major investigation into mental health in Colorado. And we have out at the table um, the community engagement kit for that project too. If you're interested, you're welcome to pick it up. Thank you. In our film, um, Wounded Places, we did have a, uh, a there's an interesting story which we tried to develop. One of our characters, who's the main character, uh, has two little children she's trying to keep safe. And she's missing a tooth. And um, there was an interview we had with the woman who's running the health center, and it was really quite interesting. It made me think sort of twice about how. She was saying that um, one of the reasons that oral health was so critical in this community was that, you know, if you're trying to apply for a job, you know, and they talked about this, how, how on the one hand insurance may not cover this, but if you're trying to apply for a job, these people are having troubles getting hired and they're getting, you know, they're competing with, you know, younger kids who are, you know, less experienced. But so it was, so it was an interesting, it was not so much about youth, uh, you know, children's health, children's oral health, but just the oral health of adults and how critical that is to their, you know, their, their future, yeah, their life, yeah. Their life and their health, right. Last question. I'm curious about how we can like further create access for storytelling or maybe like, like further d democratizing storytelling. So I love what you're doing, but you know, you have 
like a big staff, kind of like Rudy was telling about, for small organizations, um, like, and I, I love that the resource Laura just shared with uh, us about, um, from CPR, but I also know that a lot of folks who are at or below the federally poverty line tend to not have computers, so it's harder to do email, they're texting. I know from our um, patient population, um, which is uh, mostly uh, immigrants, we were surprised to find only about a third of them have smartphones. But I, so I was thinking, well, smartphones could be a technology to telling your own story, but where do you, wh what do you do with it? So perhaps some ideas to create like almost more dis how we can use technology to kind of disrupt or create an ability from kind of the ground up for people to tell their stories, not just to give feedback to say the services they would need in their zip code to help address those social determinants, but also to share it and build community with one another, kind of like the power of the stat that you just talked about, Juan, and um, to start developing um, richer communities and solutions that are community driven. What happened if you, as opposed to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technology person, unfortunately, and I'm making these films, but I am not a technology person, but suppose you just did, sort of went to newsletters. I mean, really trying to collect people's stories and actually being able to physically start to circulate and share it, almost like, I mean, I don't, I, I, mean, I don't know how, that, how practical that is, but, you know, I, I just sort of think about the power of seeing your story or seeing a story, reading other, your neighbor's story, reading other people's stories collected in one place. Telling their story, like how can we help more people tell their own stories? I guess mm. is what I'm trying to get at. That's a difficult one. Are, have you ever heard of Floodlight? Um, that is a project that the Denver Foundation and the Piton Foundation and the Knight Foundation, with some help from iNews, created a couple of years ago. But it's still digitally based, so you. People would have to have some access. I'm, I'm trying. I'm struggling to remember if it's um, responsive design enough that you could use it even on a smartphone, and I, I can't tell you. But access through a library computer or something like that, and it, it's a, a website that is designed for people to tell their own stories, and it kind of walks you through how do you tell a story very simply. It has. Um, it was designed to have multiple languages, so I think Spanish was the first that they've done. I don't know if they've done any more recently. And it helps you, you know, if I want to upload a picture with this or a video or something else, it walks you through that. It, um, it it's there and available as a tool. Floodlight. I think it's called um, floodlightproject.org. If you Google floodlight um, and storytelling, you would find it. Thanking Laurel and Smith and Laura Frank again. I'm afraid we we have to wrap up. So we at the trust and all the folks in the room know that good health depends more on than just medical care. It's affected by where we live, the education we receive, the wages we earn, and the opportunities we have to make decisions for ourselves and our family that impact our health. We believe that the stories that we tell can help raise up awareness and generate political will and interest in changing these issues across Colorado and the nation. We also believe that by partnering with communities, we can advance fair opportunities for all Coloradans to be healthy. And we see communication and storytelling as a key part of that. The slides for the presentations today will be posted on our website and we'll have a live uh, uh, edited recording of the event uh, in the next couple of weeks. Also, I hope you uh, put on your calendars November 13th uh, for the final Health Equity Learning Series event this year. Dolores Roybal, who's the Executive Director of the Con Alma Foundation in, uh, in uh, Santa Fe, will be up to tell us about uh, impact in rural areas as well. I would urge you to fill out, if you could, the uh, evaluation in front of you to help us make our sessions better. And then I just have to point out that these events are a true team effort. It's an all hands on deck experience for the trust. I want to specifically thank Patricia Martinez, Barb Gallegos, Tara Spar, Rachel, I saw you taking pictures, and the rest of our staff for the nice execution of the event today. 
Also the staff of the History Colorado Center and our streaming partners in Open Media Foundation. Then there's the Health Equity Learning Series team, Scott Downs, Phil Chung, and Maggie Frazier. Another great job. Thank you for the success. And thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you.